So, Paul, let's talk about how molecules interact with light. Okay, well, um, here's a simulation of this. So, behind Brian, we've got an oscillating electric field. Um, that's this one. That's what light is, electric field goes one way than the other way. And here we've got, in this case, um, CO2, so carbon in the middle and two oxygens, a typical molecule. And they're bound together with chemical bonds, which I've represented as springs in this highly sophisticated simulation. In this case, it's covalent bonds, so there's net charge in these things. As the field goes up, it pulls the oxygen one way and the carbon the other way, and vice versa. So we're moving just a little bit here with this uh, oscillating charge right now. So it's not doing very much. So this would correspond yeah. to a frequency that doesn't have much effect. But let's increase the frequency a little bit. And we can see what happens now. So now we've excited it a lot more. It's almost yeah. like a trampoline now. Yes, yeah, so what we've done is we've hit a resonant frequency, a frequency that matches the natural frequency of this particular oscillation. So this is a sort of up and down oscillation of the carbon dioxide. Uh, and so what this means is that if you get light at this particular frequency, um, it will have a very strong effect on carbon dioxide. It will generally be absorbed. The photon will come past and make the carbon dioxide excited and be absorbed so it won't penetrate. Right. And it turns out this particular oscillation like this is the one responsible for global warming on Earth. Uh, because this particular frequency of light is the one that can normally escape from the Earth. It's being blocked when you have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from all our pollution. So this is in the infrared. So. Yeah. So this particular frequency, this particular transition has toppled several governments here in Australia. Mm. So uh, politicians probably don't like this particular oscillation. Then you make the frequency even higher still. Mm. Not then much you go out now. of the resonance again, so... It no longer matches that particular <coughs> oscillation. Yeah. Yep. But if you make it higher still, you start getting something different. You tune it in, and there'll be some other res uh, resonance. This one's a little different, though. It's not going up and down. It's going back and forth. Yes, so it's going back and forth in opposite way to... I call this like an Egyptian dance. So you're going something like this. And so this is this actually turns out to be less important on Earth because it's uh, this frequency is, is not where the Earth is radiating. Uh, but it turns out that for carbon dioxide there are basically three. You can have um, wavelengths absorbed. There's one which goes, corresponds to this, one that like this, and also one that goes a bit like this, which I haven't shown okay. here. Um, and you go for high frequency still, nothing again. You're out of the, the resonance. So what you expect is for a molecule, as you go through the spectrum, you'll see some where it absorbs and some where it doesn't, and that will depend on the what molecules are present. Oh, very good. So, uh, so CO2 is one molecule. Does this work for all molecules? Yes, yeah, CO2 is a relatively simple one. Something like N2 or O2, nitrogen, um, nitrogen or oxygen, they're not polar, so they have no net charge, so they don't have much effect. But you get something which has um, a polar molecule and where it's not in a line, it can do all sorts of things. So let's take, for example, water. And this is going to do a lot more, first of all, because most of the mass is in the middle, so it's got less moment of inertia. Right. Um, and water is sort of shaped like Mickey Mouse with two little ears, the two hydrogens off the oxygen. And so something like this, they can do all sorts of stuff. They've got many, many <coughs> more ways they can oscillate. And similarly for other things that are not in a line, like uh, methane or... Um, water is quite spectacular. You see it's doing all sorts of things. It's going like this and going round like that and back and forth and all sorts of things. This will produce, cause it to absorb all over the place. And indeed, you can do the calculation. Um, and what you can find is here we're plotting across the infrared what wavelengths different things absorb. So you've got water, and you can see it absorbs and doesn't absorb and absorb and doesn't absorb. It goes up and down like crazy because there are so many different absorptions because all the different sorts of oscillation it can do. And similarly for ammonia, NH3, and methane, CH4. And they've all got rather complicated patterns. Right, and a very distinct pattern, which obviously is this part, the energy is not going to be able to leak out in this part because it's all being blocked if it has these, these elements in it. So you really do need to worry about this if you're going to calculate what one of these planets looks like. So it's good because we can see which wavelengths are leaking out and therefore work out what's present. It's bad because it clearly means the chemistry is going to really strongly affect the flow of heat. So the heat affects what chemistry you get and the chemistry affects the heat. Well, it sounds like that's some mathematics we need to take care of. But the good thing is, is that I want to know what these things are made out of. This does give us the opportunity 
to figure that out. Yeah. So here are our ingredients. We know the lab measurements and theoretical predictions of molecular opacities. So we can estimate if you have so much methane at this temperature and this pressure, what it will do. And so when you say opacities, that's how much of the light it absorbs as it's trying to go through the material. And it depends very much on the wavelength. Yeah. We've got the chemistry rate equations, which again we kind of know. We have sort of very clever chemists around. Um, we've got pressure balance. We know that the pressure must be such that the top of the, start, uh, top of the planet doesn't collapse down or expand out. Yep. We have energy balance, law of conservation of energy. The heat leaking out must um, change the internal energy. And we have radiation transfer. So we're looking at radiation coming from one place to another, and it depends on what molecules you've got, what gets through. Right. So this depends on that, but also what exists here. So you've really got to do the whole thing simultaneously. Yes, this is how we, well, it's one way to solve it. You might guess the temperature and density profile, so how the temperature density varies as you go out. Once we've given that, we can use um, that to calculate the chemistry at each level. Once we've got the chemistry, we can compute the heat flow because we then know what wavelengths are blocked and by how much. Yep. Um, once we've got the heat flow, we can compute the temperature. Um, once you've got the temperatures, we can uh, calculate temperatures and pressures and then go back to the chemistry. And what we'll find is we go around the loop, it probably won't match. Yep. The, our first one probably didn't work and we end up with an answer here that doesn't make sense. So what we might do is tweak this and then try again and go round and round. Until we make the whole thing consistent internally with all five pieces of information we need. This is what's called iteration from the Latin word to, to, to go. You just don't get to the solution right away. You have to walk around and round in circles, getting better and better and slowly approaching perfection. And in the end, you might finally get there. <sighs> It's been a long haul. Yes. When we finally get there, uh, we get our models. We've got the uh, green and red models. Sorry for your color blindness yes, again. Yes, I'm color blind, so they look the same to me. Uh, which are for two different temperatures. And you can see they do a not too bad job in fitting the spectrum of this particular planet. So one is hotter and one is colder. Yes. And in this case, they both more or less fit the data. However, it turns out they had to fudge in this case. If you just you naively expect uh, a planet at this temperature to have no clouds, and if they had no clouds, you don't get a good fit at all. Right. So what they had to do is put in clouds. And clouds are things we do not understand well anywhere. We can't even model them on the Earth. We have some ad hoc laws. If the temperature and pressure is like this, we'll get clouds. But we, they're really too hard to model. And so we had to put them in almost by hand here to make it fit. So these things seem to be cloudier than brown dwarfs at the same temperature, maybe because they're smaller and have lower gravity. So that's one surprise. OK. Well, that is interesting, and, uh, but a mystery figure out why they would have clouds. Hmm. But apart from that, it seems to actually kind of work. And this is what allows us to get an estimate of the age and the temperature of these things, in this case, about 1,000 Kelvin.